Hello. Uh, shall we get started? Um, my name is Michael Boswell. Uh, I'll be introducing and moderating the uh, discussion in the webinar today. Um, so until recently, I was managing a COVID high care in Pretoria at Steve Beaker Academic Hospital. Um, and I have a bit of an interest in immunology. Um, so I was asked to moderate for today's discussion. So today is going to be about immunothrombosis and COVID-19. So I just thought I would introduce uh, our first speaker. So this is Dr. Susan Lowe. Her presentation is called Immunothrombosis Lessons from Other Conditions. There's a bit of a background for uh, Dr. Lowe. She's a hematopathologist at the Department of Hematology at Wits University, as is also in charge of the NHLS coagulation lab at uh, Charlotte Macheke. Apart from being a hematopathologist, she also is an active clinician and is working as a clinical adjunct at the same hospital. Um, she is actively involved in academic research and is also involved in teaching and training at the under and postgraduate levels. Um, her main research interests are in the hypercoagulable state in people living with HIV and AIDS, the pathogenesis and treatment of HIV related TTP and anticoagulation activity testing of uh, direct, act direct oral acting anticoagulants. Um, I've had the pleasure of seeing a presentation already um, and I can assure you it's really got a lot of good detail in and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, we will be playing a recorded, pre-recorded uh, version of that and I'll be moderating the Q&A after that and then uh, Dr. Lowe will join us for a discussion after the presentation. Okay. Good afternoon, colleagues and other interested parties. My name is Dr. Susan Lowe, and I am a hemato hematopathologist uh, affiliated to the NHLS, the University of the Witwatersrand, and the South African Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. I've been asked by SAIS, the South African Immunology Society, to walk down the path of immunothrombosis this afternoon. I was a bit disappointed to see that I'm asked to speak about other conditions because my first reaction was, is there anything else besides COVID at the moment? But uh, to my comfort, for my comfort, I found out that there were actually other conditions as well. So let us progress in the, proceed in the couple of minutes that we're going to have together. So even if the process is actually an ancient, conserved host defense mechanism. All organisms live under a constant threat of pathogenic invaders and the damage can lead to fluid loss and the points of entry needs to be sealed and guarded. Vertebrates, that's us, now have closed circulatory systems with platelets being the first responders to a threat. Platelets support fibrin formation, but platelets also establishes an immune defense. And therefore thrombosis can be physiological, initiated by the innate immune system to control infection. But uncontrolled thrombosis, as we all be well aware, can lead to tissue damage. Microorganisms have actually evolved to combat host defenses and have generated antithrombotic and profibrinolytic enzymes to remove restrictive thrombi and achieve pathogen dissemination in the host. This word ancient actually doesn't sit nicely with a person like myself um, getting on in life, but let's just look at where this ancient comes from. It actually comes from the animal kingdom and it comes from a, an organism called the horseshoe crab. This organism is 
the origins of this organism can be traced back 400 million years. It possesses a single multi-competent blood cell, the amoebocyte. And this cell actually migrates to wounds in, in, the, in the host, aggregates, retracts, and retracts to seal uh, lesions that have been created. It encapsulates and phagocytosis invading pathogens, and it possesses intracellular granules that are both bactericidal and procoagulant. So it is a living example of the combination of the immune and the coagulation systems, in that there is an amplifying enzyme network, cascade, with that is generated or stimulated or initiated by specific local stimuli. And there are also regulatory proteins involved, which prevents excessive systemic activation. So this mutual engagement of both systems is increasingly now recognized in humans. And we can actually think of the horseshoe, creep, horseshoe crab as being one of our ancestors. So what will we be spending the next couple of minutes on? We want to look at the two systems involved. We're going to just touch on the cross-talking role players, and then also just visit the disease processes in which immunothrombosis is of importance other than COVID-19. What about the systems? We're talking about the immune cascade and the coagulation cascade. And when we actually put pictures of the, these cascades on the screen, we can see that the coagulation cascade is actually the poor cousin um, when it comes to complexities, um, but uh, it's still of great interest to us. And as we are aware, uh, the very erudite audience that I'm talking to, the immune cascade can be divided into the innate immune response and the adaptive or slower immune response with various cells in each of these two compartments. Um, and when we talk about immunothrombosis, we are actually very interested in macrophages um, with their predecessors being the monocytes in complement that is present um, in the innate immune system and also neutrophils. Not to say that the other components of this cascade does not also participate in immunothrombosis. When we step back into the, co into the coagulation cascade, we are aware of the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway we can talk about the initiation phase and the amplification phase with uh, cells such as platelets playing a very important role and initiators such as tissue factor, which activates the extrinsic pathway. We're also aware of the conductor of this coagulation cascade, that being thrombin, uh, eventually forming fibrin clot, which is cross-linked by factor 13. So these two systems of, are of interest to us this afternoon, and, and we are be, very well versed in each of these um, systems. What about the cross-talking role players? So the molecules and the cells and the, the messengers that creates cross-talk between these two systems, the immune system and the hemostasis system or the coagulation system. And I'm just for sake of time, when my children always say to my mum, you talk too much. So for the sake of time, I'm going to concentrate on complement, platelets, leukocytes, from Willebrand's factor, and cytokines. But there is always an et, et cetera, because um, there are many more role players um, when, it, when we start talking about immunothrombosis. What about complement? We know that complement is the innate, is the backbone of the innate immune system, that it can be activated by three different pathways, that it, what the triggers are, uh, antigen antibody complexes and toll-like receptors. We know that C5A 
also in initiates the adaptive response. So crosstalks between the innate response and the adaptive response. We know that eventually there are T and B cells that are that get busy with the immune response and production of cytokines from neutrophils. We know that complement is involved in opsonization of bacteria or phagocytosis and clearance. And we are also very we all also have to remind ourselves that complement interacts with the coagulation pathway in a bidirectional interaction. An unregulated activation of complement can obviously result in, uh, in host tissue damage. So if we just spend a, a little bit of time looking at the crosstalk between complement and the coagulation system, we know that factor 12 and factor 11, two of the coagulation factors in the, uh, in the two, of the, two of the contact factors um, in the coagulation cascade, as well as precalicrinin, which is high up um, in the coagulation cascade, can be activated, uh, uh, is it interacts with factor B and complement factor one receptor and uh, actually is activated by these factors and that in, in C1 inhibitor down regulates these contact factors. So definitely an interaction has been uh, demonstrated between the contact system of the coagulation cascade and complement. C5A, one of the terminal molecules generated by the complement cascade actually interacts with endothelium and also with monocytes and results in tissue factor expression by these cells. The tissue factor being the molecule that initiates the extrinsic pathway of the coagulation cascade. And plasminogen activator inhibitor expression was also down-regulated by C5A, um, which will lead to an increase um, in, in uh, which will result in a decrease in the fibrinolysis of blood clots. 60% of protein S, protein S being a natural anticoagulant, is bound to C4B binding protein. And changes in concentration of this component of the complement cascade will result in an alteration in the natural anticoagulation balance in the coagulation cascade. The membrane attack complex, the complex can disrupt endothelial cells and platelets, creating microvesicles uh, with phosphatidyl rich nidesis for co the coagulation cascade to be amplified on. And MASP1 can actually cleave, cleave fibrin um, and, and also factor 13. Further interactions involve tissue factor pathway inhibitor, which inhibits a complement component C4 and C2 by initiating MASP2, by inhibiting MASP2. Thrombomodulin down regulates complement, thrombomodulin being a cell surface uh, natural anticoagulant. Von Willebrand's factor binds complement and its inhibitors. And factor 10A, plasmin and thrombin and calicrinin are all C3 convertases, um, which convert C3 uh, to C3B. Uh, thrombin converts C5 to C5A independently of C3 convertase. And this can just be donated, don, denoted again um, in, in, the, in the following depiction, which will be available to the audience at a later stage. If we move away from complement and we look at one of the cells in the coagulation cascade, and we're talking about platelets, we know that platelets maintain hemostasis and can cause occlusive thrombi under pathological conditions. Platelets further support coagulation factors. 
but they also participate in immunity in that they express all nine toll-like receptors and they regulate, they play a regulatory function in immunothrombosis in that they recognize and kill pathogens and they also support and modulate coagulation dependent pathogen entrapment and they can guide the innate immune cells to sites of infection and enhance the antimicrobial function. So platelets, very important roles in immunothrombosis. And just another depiction of the role of platelets. Platelet, platelets are activated by damaged endothelium um, and by pathogen-associated molecular patterns, PAMPs, and also by thrombin. An activated platelet then interacts with endothelium, with neutrophils, um, and with monocytes. Uh, they induce neutrophil netosis, and they also facilitate transmigration of both monocytes and neutrophils into tissues. And platelets in themselves, once activated, can activate complements. Platelets also activate the coagulation cascade, um, and they can express tissue factor and facilitate tissue factor release. Another cell in the immune system, namely neutrophils, neutrophils being short-lived granulocytes, they form the initial defense against invading pathogens. They are recruited to the site of infection where they proceed to eliminate or kill microorganisms and they, through degranulation, also the generation of reactive oxygen species. And they also release neutrophil extracellular traps, um, which consists of chromatin and histones, and numerous granular proteins, which are all antimicrobial. So neutrophils, who don't have to convince each other of the important role that they play in the immune system, but they also actually play a very important role in the coagulation system in that neutrophils interact with activated endothelial cells, which express P-selectin, pre-selectin, ICAM-1, CXCL1, um, and they, get, they are then captured by these molecules um, on endothelial cells. There's intracellular signaling within neutrophils um, with netosis, which can then activate coagulation factor 12 and tissue factor, and thereby initiate coagulation both through the intrinsic coagulation cascade as well as the external um, cascade. Um, neutrophils also bind von Willebrand's factor, resulting in platelet activation. And uh, they also, as we are well aware, have got antimicrobial activity. Targeting P-selectin is actually being employed as an antithrombotic strategy. P-selectin being expressed on activated endothelial cells and platelets. And by inhibiting P-selectin and reducing leukocyte accumulation, um, we can decrease fibrin deposition. So we can inhibit the coagulation cascade by decreasing P-selectin interaction uh, with, with neutrophils. Neutrophil particles, in addition, uh, have been implicated in thrombus formation because they are pro-thrombotic. And neutrophils also play an important role in, in connection with the inflammasome, which is a multi-protein complex expressed in myeloid cells and the inflammasome regulates the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, including interleukin-1, uh, with further recruitment of leukocytes to the site of inflammation. What about monocytes? Monocytes have got a short circulatory half-life of three days. They differentiate into macrophages and lipidic cells in tissues. They play an important role in the immune system but that also influences the adaptive immune system. After stimulation by thrombin and cytokines, monocytes express tissue factor, which promote thrombin generation. 
in tissue factor monocyte microparticles are also procoagulants. Another important molecule, protein molecule in the coagulation cascade, von Willebrand's factor, is a complex glycoprotein with various receptors for coagulation factor 8, for ADMTs 13, the protease that controls the size of thrombolibans factor, that also interacts with collagen in the subendothelium and with various receptors on platelets. And as far as hemostasis is concerned, is key in primary hemostasis or the formation of platelet-rich plaques. But von Willebrand's factor also is a mediator of vascular inflammation and immunothrombosis in that von Willebrand's factor facilitates leukocyte rolling, adhesion and extravasation and controls vascular permeability. Von Willebrand's factor can also activate complement and regulates nectosis from uh, neutrophils. The von Willebrand's factor Adam TS13 complex has actually been implicated in the pathogenesis of, atheros of atherosclerosis in that this complex promotes plaque formation and inflammation through macrophage and neutrophil recruit recruitment. Other role players or other cross-talking role players, even erythrocytes possess, possessing possess glycophorin A, which is a receptor for microorganisms and can act as a decoy for invading pathogens. Erythrocytes play an important role in the architectural structure of thrombi and support the innate immune system to be immunothrombosis. If we open and start the door of endothelial cells and we start talking about endothelium, we'll need a whole conference on its own. Um, but suffice to say that this very specialized organ system is responsible for the control of both inflammation and coagulation in that pro-inflammatory stimuli and trauma leads to upregulation of cellular adhesion molecules and um, which are procoagulant and also increases the permeability of these cells um, and facilitates transmigration of inflammatory white blood cells. And this uh, electron microscope a photo picture of endothelial cells is actually was actually from uh, Professor Jacobson's PhD a couple of years ago because it's just so so difficult to get uh, adequate depiction of endothelial cells and I think it's because we often forget about endothelial cells. Another cross-talking role player is the NFKPA B transcription factor which mediates inflammation with multiple links to, immuno, to the immunothrombotic process. It facilitates cellular interaction, cell survival and differentiation, and an expression of cytokines, chemokines, and coagulation factors, and can also activate plaque. It induces endothelial cell expression of adhesion molecules and facilitates binding and transmigration of leukocytes and increases the thrombogenic potential, and it results in monocyte tissue factor expression and prolongs neutrophil survival and netosis. We won't even start talking about the NF-kappa B signal, and that's not because of time constraints, it's just because of the complexity. So as far as, so we've met the systems and we've spoken about the cross-talking role players. What about the conditions in which immunothrombosis plays an important role um, other than COVID-19? Um, and when we start talking about the conditions, we are talking about conditions that are very well known to us, that maybe we don't always think of immunothrombosis being the pathogenic a process that is involved in conditions such as disseminated intravascular coagulation, arterial thrombosis, ischemic, uh, uh, ischemic heart disease, and ischemic cerebrovascular disease, and on the venous side, deep vein thrombosis, the antiphospholipid syndrome, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, thrombotic microangiopathy such as atypical 
hemolytic uremic syndrome, and possibly also HIV-associated TCP, and the procoagulant effect of, uh, of complement can result in micro and macro vascular thrombi. Understanding the molecular mechanisms will lead to novel treatments of major cardiovascular diseases, we hope, such as the monoclonal antibody, Tulizumab, which is a C5 inhibitor. And when you put these conditions into a table and see the, the various conditions, the abnormality in the coagulation system and the abnormalities in the complement uh, system, this conditions such as sepsis, trauma-induced coagulopathy, SLE, antiphospholipid syndrome, auto and allo hemolytic anemia, and conditions such as paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, and hereditary angioedema, angioedema, and we look down the table to the abnormalities in the coagulation system and the role the complement plays. You can just see various terms and cells and processes in red, and you just get a feeling again of the the role that both the coagulation system and the immune system play in all these conditions. And then the last condition that come, that appears on the screen is of great interest to myself and to my colleagues. And this is the condition termed HIV-associated TTP-like syndrome. And it's postulated that endothelial injury by HIV itself, by opportunistic infections, and by endothelial activation due to chronic inflammation with the release of von Willebrand's factor and local activation of the coagulation cascade results in microangiopathic thrombosis, uh, which manifests as a TT, as TTP or a TTP-like syndrome, syndrome. But the role of complement and the role of endothelial dysfunction in this condition, which is now seen with regularity, still needs to be completely unpacked. So the takeaway message, uh, I now feel a bit like a steam train, but I'm hoping that um, I've touched on the most relevant uh, subjects within the pathophysiology and the disease processes as far as immunothrombosis is concerned. So the takeaway message is that our understanding and appreciation of the complex relationship between the coagulation and immune systems and inflammation has advanced greatly. But despite this, the close, despite the close evolutionary ties and their capacity to cross-activate each other, there are many unanswered questions. The clinical consequences of these interactions between the two systems are evident in a variety of pathologies where coagulation and inflammation often appear inseparable. Complement inhibitors are gaining a lot of attention, as is anticoagulation and its potential for immune modulation. Um, and this will definitely uh, fill the pages of many journal journals going forward. So thank you very much. Um, any questions can be typed on the chat or we can speak after the presentation or even on email. Thank you and back to the, uh, the, the chairman this afternoon. Thank you, Michael. Hello. All right. Uh, so I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, I found that was really comprehensive overview. And I think like uh, a lot of people that are attending these webinars, uh, there's just a, you know, a massive amount of information out there about COVID. And I think we only really get to sort of skim the surface of a lot of what gets published. Uh, so having good overviews like this is very useful. Um, so I think my primary role here is to ask some questions. So I see that there is one question up already, which uh, is really nice one. 
So Susan, are uh, you there? Hello? No? Uh, I'm muting myself. I ah. am indeed here. My internet communication has not let me down this afternoon. Oh, so, wonderful. <laughs> I'm just looking at the two questions that have appeared on the question and answer button. Um, I'm starting my video so you can all see me as well. So I'm just not a blank screen. Um, so this question that we've got in, that I've got in front of me comes from Maloko Cholo. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And the question is, are platelets involved in the adaptive immunity? As far as I know, they play a major role in the innate immune system, but obviously then also talking to the adaptive immune system. Um, I don't know if anybody else can shed further light on that question. I also have a question regarding, may you please explain the TTP and HIV associated TTP lux syndrome? Um, that is an area of active research. At the moment, the postulate is that we are talking about an endotheliitis in these patients with release of von Willib, excessive von Willebrand's factor, which overwhelms the ADMTS13 proteolytic capacity plus minus ADMTS13 autoantibodies in patients living with HIV and AIDS, which then results in excessive uh, von Willebrand's factor with a microangiopathic hemolytic process ensuing. The third question I can see in front of me uh, reads as follows. Can the diagnosis of thrombocytopenia be solely based on low plated counts or are, are other cells involved in the crosstalk of this disorder, like abnormally high neutrophil levels? I unfortunately don't have the answer and I just wonder if um, can you see there is referring to ITP, to idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura, um, which I believe to be a, an autoimmune disease, but I'll have to read further about the, the role that neutrophils play in ITP. Um, and that's a very interesting question. And um, I'm hoping that I could maybe find an answer for you. Um. Susan, may I use my privilege as the moderator person to ask some questions myself? Yeah, sure. And I'm hoping uh, that I can, will be able to answer. Awesome. So the first question I had, because this is something I was wondering about uh, while we were preparing for this presentation, was um, we're very worried about sort of hypercoagulability in severe COVID, particularly during admission in, in hospital. Um, how based on what you know about sort of coagulation in general and especially from other conditions how long do you think hypercoagulability in severe COVID is likely to last in uh, the sort of in an ill patient um is it something that's likely to reverse within a matter of days or do you think it's something that might hang around for a few weeks um because i you know i just it's something i have kind of worried about with colleagues as well. I'm very pleased to say that the speaker to follow, uh, Professor Jessica Opie, will hopefully be able to answer that question because as far as I know, it's unanswered. And there are multiple studies underway across the globe. Um, and uh, Jessica, yesterday when she and I spoke, she said she will hopefully have some of the latest information regarding the duration of, of anticoagulation that's advocated in, in people that suffer from COVID. Awesome. But as far as I know, just anecdotally, that we are of the opinion that patients need to continue with anticoagulation post-discharge from hospital. The duration and the exact level of anticoagulation, I'm not sure of. And as a second, question, if I may. Uh, I don't want to take too long, but uh, this was something I was wondering about uh, toward the end of your presentation. You were talking about um, um 
so one of the things that always strikes me when I look at kind of hematology, uh, sort of clotting cascades and immune pathways is just how extraordinarily complex all of them are and how much redundancy there is likely to be across these pathways. Um, so, uh, how can I put this? Uh, do you think that targeted therapies are likely to be uh, successful or more successful in comparison to a kind of more broad based approach? Um, so, I was sort of wondering about comparing, you know, the effect of the corticoids versus some of the more directed immunotherapies and the difference in clinical outcomes that we're seeing. Um, I wonder if that might be applicable to thrombosis as well, where targeting one or two pathways might not be as good as kind of more broad-based approaches. Uh, I, I hear you, Michael, and I share your, your question. I don't know the answer either. I just know that we are often, unfortunately, we don't have access to some of these monoclonal and developed very advanced therapies and often we are faced with a patient where we've just exhausted the general immunosuppression in the form of uh, prednisone and we just wished we had access to more advanced therapies um, because uh, we, we do feel in, uh, in the third world that sometimes we have conditions that would benefit from these uh, these advanced therapies, but I don't I don't have the answer to your question. We have, for example, access to rituximab, and in our resistant patients, for example, that suffer from uh, HIV-related TTP, we have uh, we have attempted to see the effect of rituximab, but again, it's been anecdotally successful, and uh, attempting to see the effect of therapies such as the, the C5 uh, inhibitors may be of use, but I can't shed further light on this. I do apologize. No, I think it's, a, it's such a complicated field. Um, I always, it always seems to just generate more questions. Um, let's see if there are any more questions. Okay, um, I think let me just confer here quickly. I think we should probably move on to uh, Professor O.P. Um, so I think let me introduce Professor O.P. and then we can perhaps continue with her uh, discussion. So the next person that's going to be presenting is uh, Professor Jessica O.P. She is from UCT where uh, she is the head of hematology since 2018. Um, before starting in that position, she had extensive clinical and laboratory training in the UK and in Australia. And uh, she has extensive experience that she's gained in diagnostics, teaching, training, and research. Her primary research interest is in HIV-related lymphomas. And I think like uh, many of us, she has recently developed a, an interest in all things COVID. Um, and she's going to be talking about the um, immunothrombosis in COVID-19. Uh, it's an excellent presentation. Um, and I will hand over to her and suggest you will take notes. It's really nice. Uh, okay, so I'll stop talking now. Uh, then, uh, Professor Opie. All right, um, good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure um, and privilege to talk to everybody this afternoon about immunothrombosis in COVID. And I'd also like to thank um, Susan Lowe for a very interesting talk, which actually provides very nice background to um, what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so we know that thrombosis is a big problem in, in COVID-19, up to 10% of um, COVID patients become critically ill and need intensive care. 
intensive care therapy. Um, and in these patients, they have a very high cumulative incidence of thrombotic complications. And in the early data from, from Europe, um, the, both the Dutch and the French both showed that in ICU patients, even if they were receiving thromboprophylaxis, and that is um, heparin, generally low molecular weight heparin, they had a cumulative incidence of thrombosis of 49%. Um, that was confirmed pulmonary emboli, DVTs, strokes, myocardial infarctions, arterial embolisms, but the most common um, was pulmonary emboli. And that was also shown uh, with the French, and they actually compared um, the, the um, thrombosis incidence in COVID versus non-COVID, and they found that even in patients who were severely ill with ARDS from other causes, the incidence of thrombosis was significantly more higher in COVID patients. So what is going on? Why are these patients so predisposed to thrombosis? And what um, has been found in this arena? And I'm going to just really, I've got 20 to 25 minutes. I'm going to try and give an overview of this very complex and interesting area. Um, and also, as Susan said, many questions remain. So just a brief overview of hemostasis for those of you that are not um, familiar with this are not coming from a hematology background. Um, we, when we have vessel injury, we have damage to the subendothelium of the blood vessels. Uh, von Willebrand's factor and collagen are exposed. Platelets adhere to the von Willebrand's factor and platelets change shape. They adhere first to the vessel, they then change shape, they start secreting granules, become activated. At the same time, there's vasoconstriction occurring. So the, there is reduced blood flow in an effort to um, control the bleeding, and there's activation of tissue factor, which is the primary physiological um, in vivo activator of coagulation. So this activates the blood coagulation cascade, um, which is a, a very complex series of enzymatic reactions. I'm just showing it in one block here, but it's leading to the primary conductor, thrombin, which converts fibrin um, and converts, sorry, fibrinogen to fibrin, and we get formation of a stable hemostatic plug. And this is limited physiologically by fibrinolysis, so that clots do not uh, continue to extend with it when they are not needed. So, these are platelets. This is what we um, hematologists and technologists in the hematology lab look at every day. This is a um, peripheral blood smear with red cells. That is a neutrophil, and I've been talking quite a lot about neutrophils later um, in their role in uh, neutrophil extracellular traps. And these are the platelets in the green circle, very small, but very important. Um, and the next is, is a cartoon, just to show in a little bit more detail this process of formation of the primary platelet plug. So after injury of the endothelium, we have um, exposure of von Willebrand's factor um, over here in purple, adhesion of these little blue platelets, which come along, they bind the von Willebrand's factor, they become activated, recruit other platelets, and um, this primary pla platelet plug is formed. But this needs to be strengthened, um, and for it to be strengthened, we must have the activation of the coagulation pathway um, over here with the extrinsic um, factor and the intrinsic factor, and this is a little bit more complex with all the different numbers of the coagulation factors, but the important point is, is that we're leading to via the different uh, coagulation pathways to the formation of thrombin, which allows this primary platelet plug to be secured. Now, immunothrombosis in my simple um, approach is just direct interaction of activated leukocytes with platelets and coagulation factors. Complement is also playing a role um, and I'm not going to be focusing as much on complement in this talk, but more on the um, activated um, leukocytes and the role of the uh, neutrophil extracellular traps. Just one slide on fibrinolysis, which is very important in controlling clot um, formation and extension. And here we have the release of tissue plasminogen activator, which the clinicians amongst you will be very familiar with because this is used to therapeutically to treat myocardial infarctions and can be used to treat, um, uh, it's, a, it's a thrombolytic drug that's been um, 
that's used clinically. Um, and here you can see its role. It converts plasminogen to pl plasmin, which is an enzyme which breaks down the clot resulting in D-dimers and other fibrin degradation products. And I'm sure most of you will have heard about D-dimers and how they are elevated in um, COVID patients. I've put a yellow circle here around plasminogen activator inhibitor, which is very important. And I'll uh, come to that in a few slides, a few slides from now, talking about how this is elevated in, um, in COVID, thus preventing the activity of, of TPA and promoting the, um, the fibrin formation. Um, our, one of our um, esteemed colleagues from the 1800s, Rudolf Virchow, is a, 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 he taught uh, hundreds of years ago on um, thrombosis and his teachings are still true today and very important to understand the principles of stasis of blood flow endothelial injury and hypercoagulability, the three in this triad um, are the three things that predispose to thrombosis. And in um, COVID-19, we know that um, the blood vessels are very, very abnormal. There is endothelial injury and there is stasis due to these profoundly injured microvasculature. So this is um, images from um, healthy lung, and a COVID lung in post-mortem studies published in um, the New England Journal in May. Very elegant, beautiful study. And this is electron microscopy um, with 3D visualization showing the difference between the normal and the injured uh, microvessels in COVID-19. And in just a bit higher magnification on the left, another interesting thing is that we see an increased angiogenesis occurring in COVID-19. So there is new vessel formation occurring and they're sprouting off um, from these capillaries. And when compared to other patients with um, severe um, influenza and acute respiratory distress syndrome, the COVID patients had far more of these um, new vessels, further leading to the abnormal endothelium and surface that the um, blood vessels and the cells are interacting with. And here we have an endothelial cell lining the endothelium, which is very swollen. Um, and in fact, they actually managed to even um, photograph the viral structures inside the endothelium and show that it's beginning to detach from the basement, um, the basement membrane. So really these direct viral effects on the endothelium, in addition to the perivascular inflammation, are contributing to the severe endothelial injury in COVID-19. So what happens when the endothelium is damaged? It changes from an anticoagulant surface to a procoagulant phenotype. We have the release of these ultra-large von Willebrand factor multimers, which um, Susan spoke about so nicely, um, and they are binding platelets to damaged endothelium, so they are prothrombotic. We have overexpression of tissue factor. We have then an imbalance of the normal, very delicate uh, balance between procoagulant and anticoagulant pro proteins leading to hypercoagulability. And this is all worsened by stasis due to local vasoconstriction. And that is due to hypoxia, so low oxygen levels in, in these patients with COVID and the damaged endothelium. So all three components of virtuous, tri uh, virtuous triad are met. And just to show you um, some lovely images from our own um, UCT post-mortem study from my colleagues, um, Prof. Pillay and Prof. Dida. This is a patient who died from COVID-19, a Hurtiskia patient. And this is the alveolus in the lung and the um, alveolar membrane. And this is a microcapillary with a thrombosis, a microvascular thrombosis present. And they were able to visualize many viral structures in, within the alveoli of these patients. So um, this is a very nice cartoon, which is showing an overview of the pathophysiology in COVID-19. We have the, um, the virus attaching to the angiotensin converting to angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which is the receptor for um, COVID. And this is very widely present. It's present on endothelial cells, on lungs, on pneumocytes, in the heart, kidneys, um, in the intestines, in the biliary tract. Um, so it really is a systemic disease, although the lungs tend to be 
worse affected. And this is, leads to an excessive immune response with a cytokine storm with increased interleukins, GCSF, TNF, and interferon gamma, and many others. And then we have a local and systemic inflammatory response, which leads to hypercoagulability and this very abnormal endothelium with um, activation of endothelial cells, platelets, and the leukocytes and monocytes. So we have a very high um, increase in von Willebrand's factor and tissue factor, high fibrinogen levels in factor VIII, uh, increased thrombin generation, and have very high D-dimers with fibrin deposition. Um, and all of this is aggravated by hypoxia, and we have both microthrombosis uh, occurring in the capillaries and macrothrombosis occurring in the larger vessels, um, both venous and arterial, and, and, and sometimes in very unusual ways that we don't see in other um, conditions. So for example, young patients with um, arterial strokes and patients who have myocardial infarctions in the absence of atherosclerosis or underlying obvious causes. And just a quick word here that this COVID microangiopathy that develops is distinct from others, uh, other thrombotic macroangiopathies that we are very familiar with um, clinically and in the hematology lab, such as disseminated intravascular coagulation, um, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, which most cases in South Africa are related to HIV, which um, Susan spoke about, and antiphospholipid syndrome, for example. So what happens, what is causing the actual acute respiratory dis distress syndrome in these patients? So they have acute inflammation, and these pro-inflammatory cytokines recruit inflammatory white blood cells into the alveoli. And there is a huge insult to the alveolar capillary membrane, which leads to very compromised gas exchange. Um, the exudation of fluid occurs into the alveoli, rich in white blood cells, coagulation factors, and fibrinogen. Tissue factor is exposed on endothelial cells and leukocytes, further stimulating um, thrombosis via um, the coagulation cascade. We have deposition of fibrin, which in the alveoli, and um, also activation of neutrophils to form neutrophil extracellular traps, which further amplify tissue factor exposure. And elevated plasminogen activator inhibitor, which I showed you before, is expressed on cell surfaces and prevents the degradation of fibrin. So this is um, a cartoon to demonstrate that. Um, this is the pulmonary vasculature with the leaky endothelium. The neutrophils are leaking through. Um, the um, tissue factor is exposed. We have um, fibrinogen, which is passing through into the endothelium coagulation factors. And within the alveolus, we have this very cell-rich, um, protein-rich fluid um, with um, tissue factor being exposed on these activated leukocytes. We have um, uh, UPA and TPA in blue, which are not um, suppressed, uh, sorry, which are um, suppressed by excess plasminogen activator inhibitor. So in fact, these fibrin deposits cannot be dissolved as they should be physiologically. Um, and TNF is further stimulating all this process. And just a word on these neutrophil extracellular traps. Um, which occur in response to acute infection. So these occur both in response to bacterial or viral infection. And what happens is that neutrophils, which I showed you uh, right back in the beginning with the platelets, and these are the most common white blood cells that we see in the, um, in the human blood um, with these um, segmented neutrophils. And what happens is, is that they, um, they form pores in the membrane and they, um, have a large extracellular structure which is then released from inside the neutrophils. And this large net is composed of um, DNA, it's composed of neutrophil enzymes like myeloperoxidase, it's composed of histones, um, and this is a huge surface is, which is both procoagulant and actually physically traps um, bacteria as part of the immune system. So, um, this is physiologically um, developed to try and prevent 
um, pathogens from actually invading into the tissues and extending their infection. But of course, this can become dysregulated, this process, and lead to um, net mediated tissue damage, hypercoagulability, and thrombosis. And these images are taken from a patient with septic shock and DIC. This isn't from a, um, a COVID patient. I'm going to show you images later of um, patients with COVID and net formation. This is just very interesting um, to show how the, um, the histone tails need to become altered from a positive charge to, and they become citrullinated. So they are now um, uh, not positively charged, they are neutral. And this allows the condensed chromatin to unravel into a decontent, uh, decondensed chromatin, which can then be extruded by the neutrophil. So the net formation cannot occur unless the um, chromatin has become decondensed. And this has become very um, topical in the literature, in the COVID literature recently. In fact, um, uh, 3rd of September, it was published in Blood um, that nets contribute to um, the immunothrombosis in um, COVID-induced um, ARDS. And um, here is a, just a summary of what they found in the experiments. And I'll show you some of the experiments. We have neutrophils binding to the endothelium via von Willebrand's factor and platelets. We then have activation of the neutrophils to form these big nets and platelet factor four is um, released from platelets. So they actually were able to demonstrate that within the nets. Um, and this is all occurring in the lung of Yoli. Trying to change the slide. There we go. Um, so this is from the same paper uh, where they actually um, showed these beautiful um, experiments or beautiful demonstrations of um, net formation in COVID patients. So this is at autopsy and on the left is a normal lung and the yellow arrows are showing normal neutrophils that are not um, uh, forming nets, and this is just a higher magnification in the bottom row. And in these three cases, you can see the different colors that are coming up. You can see the aggregation of neutrophils. So the different colors, red is myeloperoxidase. Um, that is one of the main enzymes, um, which, um, which is contained within neutrophils, and it, it has become um, extruded in these patients. Histones in green, and cyan is the co-localization of DNA with citrullinated histone. So this is cyan, this, this um, sort of light blue color. And really very beautifully shown here in this um, thrombus in the vasculature, how it is absolutely packed full of, of neutrophils and, and, and nets. Um, and in fact, platelets are not, the platelets are obviously a lot smaller than the neutrophils, but in between would be um, platelets and coagulation factors. And, um, and then they also looked at 33 COVID patients and 17 controls, and they measured nets. They were able to measure the nets um, circulating in these patients' uh, plasma. And what they found was that in intubated severely ill patients with COVID, they had statistically higher levels of nets compared to the healthy donors. Of course, we all have nets. Um, all the time, so there's a low level of nets is physiological, but these were increased in the severely ill COVID patients. They were increased, but not as much in the non-intubated patients and coming down towards normal in the convalescent patients who were recovering. And similarly, the uh, nets were also markedly increased in the non-surviving patients compared to those that, um, that survived. Sorry about the delay, it's just uh, taking a while to respond. There we go. So um, this dysregulated net formation in COVID seems to be playing quite a key role to the pathogenic um, immunothrombosis. And these nets are a potential biomarker for severity and inhibiting the nets could also ameliorate the net mediated inflammatory and thrombotic damage. 
And how could this be done? Well, we already know that um, the umbilical cord plasma of neonates contains netosis inhibitors, and the various enzymes in the process of net formation can also be inhibited, such as neutrophil elastase, which is already in phase one trials. And another drug um, which has uh, got a potential is colchicine. So colchicine is an old drug which we have used um, for gout to treat gout. Um, and what it does is it actually inhibits the um, recruitment um, and um, ingression of neutrophils to in the inflammatory sites. Um, so, so that is um, another avenue. And then the secretion of the actual um, the actual interleukins, the actual cytokines, can also be blocked. For example, here interleukin one trials, um, anti interleukin one are, are underway. So here we are with a very nice, um, a nice diagram also published uh, recently, um, which shows the potential drivers of COVID um, as the neutrophil extracellular traps and how they could actually be um, inhibited through various uh, mechanisms. So uh, we could block the neutrophil elastase inhibitors, which are essential to net formation. They assist with the chromatin unraveling. You could block the um, pore formation in the membrane of neutrophils. So the neutrophils have to have membranes formed in their pores to um, release their nets. That can be blocked very interestingly with a drug called disulfiram, which we use in um, chronic um, alcoholics um, and to, to try and help them uh, to stop drinking. We can use DNAs drugs and we can use um, PAD4 inhibitors to stop the um, citrullination that I spoke to you about and showed you the slide of. In addition, um, we've got the interleukin 1b inhibitors, that's anankinra, which is currently um, in trials, colchicine, which is blocking the neutrophils coming into this area, and again, the elastase inhibitors and the DNAs. Um, and just some other evidence also about um, nets in COVID. So this Greek, um, Greek group um, also published uh, recently um, regarding the interaction of complement with platelets, net, and thrombin. And they looked at COVID-19 um, samples and um, net formation, as well as human endothelial cells in co-cultures. And what they found was that neutrophils of COVID patients had very high tissue factor expression and released nets carrying active tissue factor. And, and not only that, but healthy control neutrophils um, who were treated with plasma from COVID patients um, generated tissue factor bearing nets that induced thrombotic activity of these um, endothelial cells. And they also demonstrated that inhibition of, of net formation or complement attenuated the net associated thrombogenicity. And so here is, um, I'm not going to show you all their experiments, but this is a very nice one to show. So this is an untreated um, patient. So these are control neutrophils. So these are normal neutrophils that are treated um, with COVID serum and COVID plasma. And you can see the big difference here in the tissue factor. Um, they're using here um, fluorescent dyes and confocal microscopy to demonstrate the tissue factor on neutrophils. And here it's absent. And when the COVID serum is added, um, which would contain all the cytokines and um, inflammatory factors and coagulation factors, um, we have a um, marked increase in tissue factor expression and also an increase in neutrophil elastase, not quite as prominent, but certainly tissue factor is very obvious. And here you can see the, um, the increased, marked increase in um, uh, tissue factor expression, which is then going to drive the coagulation cascade, very, very prothrombotic. Complement, will complement inhibition be a new target in treating these patients? So this is a possibility. Um, and as Susan said, there are, um, there is work, a lot of work being done in this area. Um, and uh, to me, the complement cascade is very complicated. Um, I'm sure the immunologists are uh, note off by heart, but I've just put it down to uh, use this nice, simple um, 
diagram. And here, this um, particular paper was talking about um, a murine model which had a knockout lacking um, C3, and they, so they were unable to convert. Um, uh, ac activate the common complement pathway in these particular mice. And in these um, mice who were infected with COVID-19, um, the SARS COVID infection severity um, went, was, was less, their lung function improved, the cytokine levels went down, although their viral load stayed exactly the same. So it may be as well that there are um, people who have genetic predispositions to um, pathogenic um, complement activation. Um, and we know um, that there are other conditions, thrombotic microangiopathies like hemolytic uremic syndrome, where complement is playing a very central role. But randomized control trials are needed here to investigate if um, complement inhibition could indeed improve the clinical course of these patients. So I've um, come to the last slide. Um, I've tried to uh, give a brief overview of normal hemostasis. Um, the formation of the um, platelet plug, the coagulation cascade, and fibrinolysis, and then try to um, concentrate on um, what the evidence has shown so far in terms of abnormal microvasculature, endotheliopathy, and spoken a bit about um, the pathophysiology and the role of nets and complement in driving thrombosis. There's some interesting um, therapeutic implications. I haven't spoken about all the current recommendations for um, anticoagulation and management of these patients, um, but I'm happy to address that if um, anybody would like more information on, on, on other aspects. I could try and assist with answering your questions. Thank you for your attention. All right. Ah, excellent talk. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, thank you. Um, right. Let's see. Are there? Haven't got any qu new questions come up yet. So I'll start. Perhaps. Uh, ooh, here's a question. Uh, oh, not a question. I'll start with a question. Um, so while going through this uh, presentation, um, so I think. One of the therapies that's really had the biggest impact for COVID-19 has been uh, dexamethasone and the glucocorticoids. So I wanted to ask, do glucocorticoids have any um, impact on coagulation and, and or on net formation? That's a very interesting question. I'm afraid I have not seen any studies where they are directly looking at um, steroids and, uh, and net formation, but it would make sense. It would certainly um, fit that the net formation is reduced and that that may be part of the reason why um, these patients respond well to, um, to steroid therapy because they are actually um, reducing the cytokines and reducing the um, inflammatory response. So, so I, I haven't actually seen any direct research, um, but it would make sense that, that that is one of the mechanisms, yes. Uh, right, I see people have come in with some questions. Um, so uh, I will perhaps just read it. Uh, so there's been a lot of information coming out that the immune responses to COVID-19 and disease severity differ by um, biological sex. And there was just, this question is wondering if net formation and thrombosis are impacted on by biological sex in humans, so between males and females. Sorry, I missed some of the question. Where, um, oh, here we go. Um, so it's from LM. There have been recent information coming forth that immune responses and disease very differ, differ with gender. Just wondering if role of net. Uh, okay, so that's interesting. So yes, so men do have a higher um, predisposition to thrombosis in general, um, and also age is is a big factor. So um, for any normal person who um, 
who doesn't have COVID, one, the main risk factor is actually age. So your risk at 80 is something like a thousand fold what it is at 20. So that is certainly one of the reasons why we would have um, worse mortality in older patients. Um, and then in terms of um, uh, atherosclerosis and underlying um, diabetes, those conditions are uh, more prominent also in, in the male gender, certainly in um, premenopausal uh, years. Um, and if the role of net and thrombosis is different, so there's, there's nothing that I, can, that I have seen regarding net formation, differences in net formation between men and women. I don't think the studies are big enough that they've looked in, with these experiments um, uh, at, at actual net formation between uh, men and women. Um, but um, generally, um, and I'm sure Susan uh, would perhaps help with this as well, but in general, um, the, uh, the men do have a higher rate of thrombosis than women. Is there anything that Susan would like to add? I can just add and support Jessica and what you just said, Thank men you. do have higher thrombosis and it seems it relates to them having more vessels and more valves and um, yeah, so that is true. Although they don't have uh, the hormonal uh, pro, pro thrombotic hormone called estrogen, but, but um, men do suffer from, yeah, from sizable amount of venous thromboembolic disease. Thank you. Um, and then I've got another question from Ruth Rankole. What is the role of convalescent plasma in COVID? Thank you, that's a very excellent question. Um, so convalescent plasma is using the plasma of patients who have recovered from COVID as treatment for patients who have severe COVID. Now, this is one of the quite a number of um, medica medications or treatments that can be that are being used in clinical trials um, and would be and are not standard use. There have been some good results. It um, the, the um, challenges are to find the donors who have high levels of COVID antibodies. So uh, remember that patients who've been more severely infected have higher um, antibody levels and for them to actually donate plasma and for it to be given to, um, to, to the patient. So that has been used um, uh, in a few, I, I'm aware of a few cases where it's been used in South Africa and it has been used overseas, but it's not um, a sort of standard, it's not widely available because you can't really um, store the plasma. It has to be done on a, on a case by case uh, basis. And then I've got one more, Mohammed Baez. Thank you. Uh, five milligrams colchicine for coronary, coronary artery disease. What dose would, could be suggestive for net inhibition? <laughs> I don't think they're able to say how, um, what exact dose would affect the, the, the net. The, the, the concept is, is that the colchicine would um, prevent the influx of neutrophils into the area of um, localized thrombosis, much as it would in, in um, gout or any other condition, I would anticipate it would be those sort of doses. Um, although I'm not dealing with that condition very regularly at the moment, I'm not sure um, what exact doses, but I would imagine the same as, as would be used for um, coronary heart disease. COVID and coronary heart disease, I presume. Any more questions? Uh, I think there is another question here from Morris Goodseer. Oh, Marius, yes. Um, is it at the bottom? Yeah. Oh, here we go. Um, okay, Marius. Uh, it appears that some patients with COVID appear to have pulmonary emboli at first sight, but often no thrombi can be demonstrated in their lower limbs. Is this simply because of the inflammation? And yes, yes. So that is the um, that is the concept that there is very localized um, increased thrombosis occurring primarily in the pulmonary vasculature, and in many of the patients, they don't have 
um, identifiable peripheral thrombi, distal thrombi that can be uh, visualized by ultrasounds or, or, or scans. Um, so that can actually make it, can be very difficult to actually diagnose the patients. They often um, are diagnosed on clinical grounds um, as deteriorating due to um, respiratory deterioration. And then they can have um, cardiac echoes to look for um, evidence of right, um, right heart strain. Um, but these patients really need to be treated empirically. And I think that's what's been happening in South Africa. We, we, don't, we haven't been able to send patients for um, CTPAs um, and so on due to the infectious risks um, for, for staff um, and also to the availability of these um, um, radiographic um, instruments. So patients are really treated empirically with, um, with anticoagulation. And certainly in our, uh, in our intensive care unit, the majority of our patients have been on a therapeutic dose um, uh, clexane um, from admission and less contraindicated. Awesome. Um, Thank you, Nemisa. Uh, could I perhaps ask, ask my question again uh, that I asked the son earlier? Um, uh, how long do we expect um, this kind of hypercoagulability to last in COVID? Do we expect it to last on the order of days after, say, clinical resolution, so after their hypoxia is resolved? Or do you think it might still hang around for a few weeks? Uh, just thinking in the context of these reports of kind of long COVID symptoms that is getting a lot of uh, attention. Yeah, so, so um, certainly there, there would be an increased... Um, thrombotic risk to patients um, after they are discharged. Um, and there are a number of trials that are underway uh, looking at um, different agents and different treatments in that context, where the patients should be given low molecular weight heparin injections after they're discharged for how long? Should it be 28 days? Should it be six weeks? Um, those things are, are being looked at or um, which is more convenient but more expensive is the direct oral anticoagulants like rivaroxaban. Um, and after we spoke yesterday, I went to go and see if there was any more updated recent guidelines. And it seems that in, in the ideal scenario where you have um, availability of all these different agents, it's very much an individualized approach. So it depends on the particular patient's risk factors. Um, for example, diabetes, hypertension, um, their uh, BMIs, uh, how sick they've been clinically, and um, what the particular social circumstances are in terms of, of where they're going back to, um, how they can be monitored, etc. So there's no actual uh, strict um, guidelines as that have come out that say we must give them aspirin or low molecular weight heparin or rivaroxaban as yet, but there are clinical trials are still going on and I'm waiting to see the results, unless, Suzanne, you are um, aware of anything that you'd like to add. No, Jessica, I'm not aware of anything that's been published. I just know of multiple trials across mm. the globe that is looking at this issue, and hopefully mm. there will be some answers. Mm. Excellent. Um, I I think it might be time for us to sign off. Um, so I just want to say thanks very much to Dr. Lowe and Professor Opie um, for presenting for us today. I think those were excellent presentations. Um, our next series uh, is going to be on the 13th of October. Um, and you can see the flyer here uh, presenting there. Uh, so it's, got to, it's going to be Dr. Lala. Uh, Dr. Salu and Professor Rousseau, um, and I highly recommend everyone uh, tuning into that as well. I'm sure it'll be an excellent discussion. Um, and thank you everyone for participating and for coming to the presentation.